Neurodiversity is a term you might have heard recently, but what does it mean? I spoke with Maria Bourbon, Lead for Neurodevelopmental Conditions Pathway at Oxford Health NHS Foundation Trust. Izzy B. Phillips, singer with the band Black Honey, whose debut album is climbing up the UK charts. Eloise Stark, psychology researcher at the University of Oxford. And Mercury Music Prize nominee, Loyal Karner, to find out more. So what is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is something that you would find as part of normal human evolution, a little bit like you would find kind of different races or different hair type, um, kind of a way of, of thinking. So different people have different wiring and, and that's where um, neurodiversity comes from. So rather than thinking that because you're different, there is a disability or pathology or an illness associated to it, it just means that you're different in the way that you think. What we know is that this does occur naturally in the population and we know that numbers are going up because people are recognising that diversity as being part of who we are. So conditions that could be seen as, the, as neurodiverse would be autism. And we have something called ADHD, which stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which is a mouthful. Um, something called ADD, which probably we see more in girls, and that is the attention deficit disorder, so without the moving bit. Um, dyslexia uh, is another uh, condition that you would find under neurodiversity. Um, other things would be something called dyscalculia, which is more related to numbers rather than words, and dyspraxia, which is uh, an inability to coordinate. So people tend to be a bit more clumsy and find very difficult to um, organise themselves. So in terms of autism, some of the difficulties that people often have um, would be aside the organisation, might be sometimes um, getting along with others. And that is because particularly the non-verbal language can be quite difficult to, to understand. One of the things that can happen is that people will not always have the full grasp of what something means. Um, so they might actually take things literally. So if you are different, if your wiring is different, the things around you will need to be different. You know. um, for instance, I'm left-handed. If you make me do everything with my right hand, I'm not going to do it properly, am I? It's not because I'm not trying hard enough. You're giving me the wrong tool to use. Um, so what we need is to look at the environment and ensuring that it's adapted for someone who is neurodiverse. And depending on how adapted that environment is, people can do very well or they can do really badly. So, um, so some of the issues that we often encounter is people who have sensory difficulties. It can be a superpower. For instance, if you are a chef and you have really, really sensitive taste, that can be amazing, but that has to be in the right environment. However, if you work perhaps in the school canteen or if you have to <laughs> do something with your taste, actually it can be really quite awful because, you know, you, you, instead of, of being a pleasant experience, it would be against it. So with the ADHD, there are, there are kind of a couple of symptoms. One of them is the inattention and the other one is the hyperactivity. So there are drugs that can target that inattention in in particular, a lot of, of people describe the fact that when they have ADHD, they try, you know, they, they've done things as they think. So, you know, that stopping and thinking doesn't happen. And then they do it and it's like, oh, no, you know, I didn't really mean that. Mm -hmm. So they get in trouble a lot. So as a result, Actually, they feel quite bad because they know that they've done wrong and they want to stop. But if you have that high level of impulsiveness, it's really tricky to, to stop. So medication is, is something that you, you can take to help you. But there's increased evidence that mindfulness and meditation in particular can be really helpful with people with ADHD. 
Um, and that is because mindfulness is about learning to stay in the present and, and learn to focus. So you're kind of stimulating the areas of your brain that perhaps are a little bit underdeveloped. How has having ADHD like affected you just generally? I always find that one really hard because I obviously don't know what life is like without it. Um, but I'd say generally my friends would probably tell you that I don't listen um, just ongoingly. Um, and I find films really hard to watch. I talk throughout them. And I find, my, especially in the band, like my concentration length is a lot shorter than everyone else's. So I have, like, they kind of cater to me with that, like, we don't do sessions for a long time. Like, the guys know that I like to have a lot of breaks, like, lots of little, little and often. Yeah. And, um, this, they're really great with that stuff, like, they're really supportive, so. What treatments, and you sort of mentioned this a bit, mm. but, like, and support were you offered, like, throughout? I was super lucky, like, I really bad dyslexia as well, so from the beginning I had learning support. Um, I was sent to, I had this, like, I was very badly behaved in school, which is probably partly to do with why they found out, like, or made sense to everyone when they found out. Um, and I had this teacher that I had to go to see and be there be like, this is John. John has a sad face. Remember the last time you had a sad face and why? <laughs> and I had this like card, like this sort of, I was like 13, 14. Um, had this card where if I was gonna like be like a nightmare, I could go and see this teacher and she would coach me through like emotional behavior therapy. So I was super lucky. I mean, I guess like school like wasn't for me really, but in the support that I got, made it work for me. Yeah. What did it mean to you when you were first diagnosed, like, the actual label? To be honest, like, I can't really... I can remember all my mates being like, oh, like, makes sense. Um, the thing that's interesting about it, which I still find interesting, is that I actually, on the spectrum of ADHD, I came much higher under ADD than ADHD. They were like, I could actually potentially just be ADD, but, like... I don't know, my mum would probably disagree with that. <laughs> well, what does it mean to you now? Is it the same sort of thing? Um, it's weird. You grow out of it, like, to a point. Like, there's a lot that you could grow out of. Like, I'd say I'm, I'm not as hyperactive as I was, obviously, as, like, a, a young teenager. Um, I have... I, ha I, still, I still can't concentrate. I still can't watch films. I still can't... Sometimes my brain just doesn't play ball with me, and I get frustrated and angry and I just have to be more patient I have to learn like you know what everyone else everyone else can do it but that doesn't mean that I'm worse at stuff it just means I have to just take more time yeah. and do it in my own time and really like and really just like push through like when I have when I have because songwriting is kind of cool for that because obviously I'm self-managed pretty much most of the time I can write for a bit I can go for a walk I can go to the pub with my friends I can write on the go I can I can do a lot and I think one thing actually that really helps me is doing two things at once so if I am writing a song usually I'll be like cutting up bit pieces of paper or coloring in at the same time and those things are like exercises for keeping my hands busy or doodling keep my brain on the task at hand better because yeah. it's more subconscious if you know yeah, what I mean yeah, no, I get that. how do you manage it all now like in your day to day um, life now? Tr patience um, tr I'm really impatient so there's that I um, diet I, when they said it to me in the doctors when I f they were like you got to eat healthier because it's um, a problem like you can't eat strawberry laces for dinner like you have to eat like green things and oil so I would say like actually think about what you're eating because you can make your life so much harder for yourself if you don't listen to those like recommendations. What advice would you give to some your younger self or anyone else that is younger I guess? I would say um it's gonna be okay like it is like y you you might not believe it but for every day that you've like lived through something is like a win yeah. like you've won the battle so you need to like zoom in on on the positives and like obsessively and obsessively focus on positives and then one day things will just like in a heartbeat the things that you find so hard will suddenly become 
the best things that have ever happened. Yeah, just just hang in there. Talk to your talk to your mates and just focus aggressively, like uh, like for your life on on the positives. Yeah, yeah. and eat healthily. <laughs> eat greens. Eat greens. Okay. So like you've qu talked quite a lot about your like ADHD. Like, yeah. what's the reception been like for that? Good man. Uh, it's, it's 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 the best thing. Um, I think that's that's come from from my music is being out and about like I was out the other day and you know, people people walk past me and say you know I've, I've got ADHD and you make me feel like it's okay to have ADHD which is more than I could ever ask for I, I kind of couldn't care about anything else now at this point because um, it's special because it's something that when I was younger it's all I wanted was to have anybody who could have made me feel like I was normal do you know what I mean or made me feel like I wasn't a weirdo so to, to know that I've done that to even if it's like five or ten young men young women this is a big deal for me. You've talked about like ADHD and it isn't like an extra added on thing, mm -hmm. but like it's part of you and who you are. Mm. And like, what do you think that view has made like the difference between your relationship with it? Yeah, for real. Because if, if you look at something as, as part, like a, as something else that's not part of you, then you cannot come to terms with it. So if I, if I think about myself and I think about it, because ADHD is the best and the worst thing about me, I think. So, you know, if, if I look at it in any other way, then I will resent it and try and move away from it. But if it's part of me, I can't move away from myself. Do you know what I mean? I am myself. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it is, it's, it's, it's essential to, to, to not treat it as something that is separate, but something that adds to me. Because if it wasn't me, I'd be completely different. I'd be really boring. Yeah. Probably not as cool. <laughs> How has it, like, affected you and, like, things that you do? Um, in every way, um, very impulsive. So, uh, I mean, and in my life, it's been quite a good thing. I've taken a lot of risks that um, others around me weren't prepared to take. Um, I, I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve, which means when I write my music, it's, it's deeply emotional, which has helped me make sense of things in my head, but it's also helped people around me by listening to the tunes that I write. Um, yeah, I, I feel deeply, you know, which means I get to enjoy things. You know, if I, if I go out, I can go for a walk in the park and see something and it can move me deeply just because I'm so soft which is cool <laughs> you know um, yeah I don't know I think it's kind of it's helped me in, 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 in every way I think I look at things in a pra practical way like when you were diagnosed what was it around like what was it like around that time like when you first found difficult, out difficult because I, I didn't really understand myself I was young though I was at uh, primary school but I was like I uh, was close to being kicked out I was, wasn't in class that much um, but I wasn't like I wasn't malicious it was just like mischief um, and I think that's the thing that gets misconstrued with children with ADHD is that it's, it's you know, you're thought to be violent or um, kind of, yeah, malicious, like nasty. Yeah. Not, not intentionally, but that's kind of how it manifests itself. But it's not, it's just, it's, it's a difficulty in yeah, maintaining composure and concentration, which then can manifest itself into being bad. But it doesn't mean that you're morally bad. Yeah. You know? Which is when I, when I understood ADHD, I understood myself a little bit more. And then I understood when things were happening. So then you get to look at... Um, you know, what, what kind of self-help, the things that work for you, be it having a stress ball, not drinking fizzy drinks. You know, I started eating. My mum my my always fed me very well, didn't let me drink sugary drinks and whatnot, because they're bad for you anyways. Yeah. But for some with ADHD, they, they just tap into the wrong things. You know, they, I spend my life like I've had like five coffees. I don't need to actually have a coffee, you know. Yeah, cool, right. Um, what treatments and support were you offered like for it? Medication, I was offered medication. Um, later on in life, so that's um, things called Equisim, Concerta, which are like kind of the UK versions of uh, Ritalin. Um, but I didn't really, I didn't, I was dead against them. I, at first I used to do osteopathy, which was wicked. It was just a woman called Kelly used to like remove the, the bad energy from my, <laughs> my chest. I used to be really, really calm when I came out of that. But um, yeah, tablets, I took, I took the tablets at school for a little bit and I turned into a zombie. I lost my appetite. Um, I couldn't really chat to anyone. It wasn't funny anymore. I'm not that funny anyways, but I was even less funny, which, which was tragic for me because that's all I had. Um, yeah, I could have kind of, my creative side disappeared. And it was, that was when it became quite apparent to me. I think that me medicating myself or being medicated by, you know, by the hospital or school or whatever, um, really reinforced the fact that without, ADHD, without my ADHD, I wasn't myself. You know, so when they took away the thing that I was so sure before was the issue with me, which was, was the reason I got into trouble and the reason you know, maybe I didn't have as many friends as everyone else. When I lost it, I realised how much I missed it. Because, um, yeah. yeah, it was so boring. Couldn't do anything, couldn't write songs. Um, I, was, I had a drama scholarship to the school. I couldn't act. I couldn't, you know, like, feel any sort of emotion. 
And yeah. I just yeah, I didn't eat, which was the, the darkest part. Yeah. Mm. What did it mean to you when you first got diagnosed with it? Like? I was, it was, I was, what's well, it? I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but I, um, I, um, I, um, yeah, cause it was because I, when I was at school and I knew kids in my class had ADHD and I thought they were weirdos because I didn't understand ADHD at the time. So I remember being told I had ADHD and being like, I'm not like those kids at school because everything I've been told in my class was that if you had ADHD, if you were dyslexic or you had any of these things, then you were, you know, you weren't right. Do you know what I mean? You were weird and you wouldn't have any friends. And so I was like, no, 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 I'm normal. I can have friends. Do you know what I mean? I can be, I can be, I, I can be a regular kid. Watch, I'll behave. I promise. That's what I said to my mum. I was like, no, I, I won't. I won't have ADHD anymore. I promise. I promise. But as, as time went on and my mum kind of helped me understand what it was, it became everything to me because then I had an understanding of myself that was unparalleled by anything that I'd had before. Pretty, pretty good. Right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, Thanks, that my, that's my life. <laughs> um, I feel so <laughs> um, Do you wish, like, in your life you'd been diagnosed earlier or later or not at all? No, I'm happy. I'm kind of happy I got diagnosed when I did because it allowed How me. How old to, were you? I don't know. I was between the ages of like seven and ten, but maybe maybe a little bit older than that. But I, I kind of what's nice is I remember just about struggling with it enough on my own. Um, and then getting an understanding of it and then being able to deal with it myself, which I think are both very important because if I'd have if I'd known it my whole life, I wouldn't wouldn't have known anything different and then it wouldn't have been so one wouldn't have been so impassioned about uh kind of helping it change myself, but also, yeah, kind of I don't know, just wouldn't have it wouldn't have meant as much to me because I if it's something you got it's all relative, you know, if you grow up with something you know it forever, it's it's not different. Whereas yeah. I, I I kind of in, enjoy the fact of understanding that I am different because yeah. it makes my life easier. But yeah, but yeah, but I, I guess the, but with all those things coming negatives, which are you know, I can't turn my brain off. I'm annoying. I talk too much. Um, I say things that I don't mean. I do things that I don't mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I guess it's balancing those out. I think it's just about for me with having people that understood me. You know, I take my hat off to my mum and my and my girlfriend because both of them deal with me on a daily basis, and I know it is not easy. Um, but I think what's cool is that the, the positives tend to outweigh the negatives. But everything, like any anyone. It's about having self-awareness, you know, so I know these things about me. I know that I can perhaps get a bit yeah, intense or I can say things that I, I shouldn't say before I've said them. So it's just about going, well, that might happen. But afterwards, being able to look at myself and go, I shouldn't have said that. And going, look, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. You know. When were you first diagnosed with ASC? I was 27. Um, I had had uh, an assessment when I was 13 and they didn't, they weren't sure at the time. But um, when I was 27, I had a full full diagnosis. Mm, cool. How did you feel about this? Um, it was it was like I suddenly understood about myself and yeah it was amazing. There's I read a bit a book about autism and he talks about um, the author talked about finding the Rosetta Stone to your life. So like, like suddenly I could understand all about autism and how I how I'm autistic and how it affects my life. What, what are the impacts do you think of like getting diagnosed later on in life? I think it means you don't get the right support from when you're growing up, when you're a teenager, and teenagers, it's so difficult. And not knowing that you're finding all the social stuff difficult because you're autistic, it means you don't get any additional support to really help you cope, cope with that. Yeah. But I think a lot of the time, like, obviously being quite high-functioning, like, when I was younger, when I was at school, like, I got a lot from teachers, like, so I had this diagnosis, and they'd be like, no, you don't. They'd be like, no way do I believe you have that. Like, yeah. I used to get all the time, they used to be like, you know, she can talk to people, and it's like, it's literally like, that's not the diagnostic criteria. Yeah, no, I get that too. Up. People say, you can't be autistic, yeah. you've got too much empathy. Yeah. And I say, oh, I hate well, that one. people yeah. with autism have empathy, yeah. a lot of empathy, and sometimes it can make us like tired because we feel so much for yeah. other people and yeah there's lots of misconceptions I think yeah and I think that's really hard as well like, do you find it that it's quite like it defines you or that like it's just an additional thing to like you as a person I, I don't want it to define me I want my passions and my interests and my strengths to define me and the autism is something I have to cope with but it's not my identity I, I'm not just an autistic yeah. woman. I think um, that's so, like that's so important because I think as well like I've really struggled with it being identity. I've like, well, that's not that's not me. Like I have that maybe, 
Mm. <laughs> but it's not me. So, like, and I think, like, almost not, like, separating it from yourself, but, like, almost having it as, like... Yeah, like you said, like, something you struggle with as opposed mm. to something that you are and that yeah. is all that you're... Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I wrote your article about ASC and how it kind of presents in girls and women. And I found it really interesting, the bit about how with like social skills and all that like not necessarily that we don't have them but the fact that we have to think about them beforehand yeah. or like during which I found really interesting like the eye contact one about like having to like consciously regulate it and all that mm. like I like I found like it's just that things like that that you don't realize everyone else doesn't have to do mm. especially like you said as well how like you just thought everyone did it until you realized yeah. <laughs> that they didn't yeah. Yeah, that was a bit of a revelation, <laughs> realising that that was all completely different in neurotypical people. Yeah. And people often think that because you're autistic, you don't have social skills and you can't blend in and you can't socialise with people. But actually, we're sort of social experts because we learn it yeah. just like you'd learn any other skill. Yeah, and I also like really liked the bit in the article about, um, I think it was quoted from somewhere, it was like how... Um, men and boys with autism are like little um, professors. professors and girls yeah. are like little psychologists. Yeah. I just love that. That made me laugh so much. I was like, that's so true. Because I think as well, like, like you've just touched on like probably the biggest problem with autism in girls is just that it's so different to boys. Like when I read it, I was quite like fascinated by it because my, when my, my mum read it as well yeah. and she was like oh I know quite a lot of this because obviously mm. she's looked into it for me but for me like a lot of it was like this is how other people feel too and it's mm. like and there's like reasons behind this and actually people know that this is the case because I think a lot of the time I've just thought like, like I only I know this and like mm. all these people just don't know what would you say are your like the positives for you personally of your ASC as such so I'm doing a PhD and I can get like super focused on what I'm doing, work for hours and produce really like a lot of work. Um, so that's really helpful. But sometimes I don't see the bigger picture as much. I can focus in on the details yeah. and I need someone to say, hang on a minute, like, where's this going? So that's a strength, but also can be a weakness, I guess. Like it is restricting as, in some ways, mm. but in other ways, it's just a little extra work that we have to do, I yeah. guess. I read, um, I was, I've got a book about autism and women and it was saying today that I was reading it, um, how about 50% of people with autism, their special interest is actually in the creative arts. And there's this like misconception that everyone with autism is like a mathematician yeah. and we can like make huge numbers in our heads <laughs> and like remember pi and it's like do I really this. cannot do that. <laughs> yeah, no, neither can I. And I was like, when I first got diagnosed, I was like, gosh, I can't. I can't be autistic. I'm not yeah. like Rain Man. I can't like remember every day yeah. of every date that has happened in like yeah. the last century. And yeah, I remember saying stuff like that to my mum. I'd be like, "Well, how come this has happened? Like, why have I had to be diagnosed with this? But I don't even have a special talent. Like, it's yeah. so like sort of stereotype that like it is a bit like that." But and there's like statistics that people with autism have like much higher rates of anxiety and depression than the normal population. And I think that's because the world isn't really designed for us. Yeah, that's so like, true. I get the bus into Oxford every morning and it's noisy and it's bumping around and I, I end up arriving with real like sensory overload yeah. um, and anxiety. But the world's never gonna be designed for autistic people, so yeah. we have to adapt to it. So how do you manage when like, you are just a bit overloaded. Like, normally I like... I think, for me, it's quite hard to recognise when that's happening, because mm. obviously, like, I'm still a little bit in denial, and I'm like, no, I'm fine. No, not, not got that. But I think for my mum to be able to be like... I think, like, I rely a lot on her for this, to be mm. like, look, Sadie, like, do you need a break? Like, mm. for her to be like... Because sometimes I get quite carried away with it and like even if I'm completely like exhausted from it all like I will socialize like yeah. repetitively for days and days and days and then my mum will be like Sadie take a break and I think not only is it being exhausted from it and not being able to do it mm. it's also misreading it and being like no I need to do this 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 this, this right yeah. now otherwise people won't like me yeah and it's like 
Do you get that? Yeah. Yeah, I feel a huge social pressure. Yeah. To join that. in with every event yeah. and see all my friends every day. Yeah. And it's really hard to recognise that actually maybe you can't keep up with everyone else. Yeah. Sometimes you have to take some time out. Yeah. I found I found that hard to acknowledge. Yeah, yeah. and I think yeah. And one of the one of the ways we get exhausted is by camouflaging. Yeah, which so, I found really interesting because I've actually never heard that term you? Yeah. before I read your paper. So, like, cam- camouflaging means, like, you... It's like being an actor. So rather than saying, like, sitting in the corner and talking about your special interest, you, like, <laughs> you copy people's body language and yeah. you... Mirror it. Mirror things and you yeah. make eye contact and you... It's, it's just like being an actor, I, fi- I find... Yeah, and you, an impromptu actor on the you spot. You just <laughs> pretend to be normal for yeah. hours and hours, and then that's exhausting. Yeah, I love it. Like, I always say to my mum, I'm like, I can be weird now. And she's yeah. like, you can be weird here. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm just running around being a weirdo. But yeah, like, I, I find that with my family as well. Yeah. I'm just like, oh. It's a bit of a just relax, because they just get the it. mask. Yeah. And, yeah. When we started talking about making these films, I had no idea what it would involve. It's been an amazing experience. I've learnt so much about myself and it's helped me to understand who I am, what I've been through and where I can go from here. I hadn't really realised how much I've been battling with my own diagnosis. Maybe in part because of stereotypes and prejudice. But I've met some amazing people who are living well with their differences and have shown me that it's alright to be different and it can even be a good thing. If you or someone you know is affected by the issues raised in this film, there are places that you can go for help and support. There is a lot of information available on the internet which can sometimes be confusing or misleading. In the links below this film you can find a list of some trusted organisations that publish high quality, reliable information and give advice on evidence-based treatments. Like a child, bitter and sweet, you got me twisted.